to the face cloth of Oviedo in the Shroud of Turin. The Shroud of Turin is the most scientifically investigated historical artifact in history. The most, by far, like 10, 20, 30 times more scientific investigation than any other historical artifact. So that one I'm very familiar with, and I can say I believe you know, and, and I have to say this, you know, just from the vantage point of science, right? I'm 99.99999% sure that that is really the burial cloth of Jesus. I simply do not see how the image could have gotten on that cloth without a huge burst of radiation. Whether it's particle radiation, whether it's light radiation, I'm not sure. But whatever the source of radiation, it's powerful, it's miraculous. There's just no way that any, you know, the, uh, uh, decomposing corpse could ever produce such an image uh, with such a, uh, an amount of radiation and power. I mean, uh, unless, you know, every single solitary stable atomic uh, nucleus in that, uh, in that uh, body is disintegrating at the same time giving rise to a low temperature nuclear reaction, that's the particle radiation hypothesis, or six to eight billion uh, watts of, um, you know, about a half a million searchlights worth of light energy is emerging from that body for one forty billionth of a second vacuum ultraviolet uh, radiation that's culminated. So you, you, you take your pick. It's a miracle. And by the way, those 372 blood stains on that, on that cloth, every single one of them has, you know, uh, AB blood type, human hemoglobin, human immunoglobulins, and a mixture of ferritin and creatinine, uh, which synthesis, by the way, only happens in people experiencing a heavy polytrauma. Right. Hmm, sounds very similar uh, to uh, Jesus' crucifixion, et cetera, et cetera. And it describes and actually validates the detailed gospel accounts of the unique crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Yeah, do I think it's authentic? I totally think it's authentic. Uh, no question to me. You know, I, I mean, even if somebody come up with a carbon dating, you know, that's another, you know, crazy carbon dating like the one in 1988, which has been completely debunked, I, I, I would have to believe, uh, you know, that N14 um, um, isotopes uh, got turned into carbon-14 isotopes, um, you know, in that cloth with a burst of neutron radiation that happened in a particle disintegration. I, I, so I'm, I'm not at all certain that a carbon dating could ever work because of the neutron flux that very likely happened on that cloth. If it did irradiate all that N14, uh, which is common, right, in cellulose and linen cloths, right, uh, the cellulose constructions, there's a lot of N14 there, and that's a, a, a nitrogen uh, isotope there. It, get, it gets converted with neutron irradiation into C14, which is what is measured in the carbon-14 uh, dating test. So all these things, you know, I, I'm very sure not only the shroud authentic, I think it just contains a relic of Jesus' transformation uh, from his physical state to his transphysical state uh, right there in that burst of radiation and leaving as, it, as, as Jesus moves to his glorified state an image of himself uh, in his physicality right bam on that clock. Well, now let's take the face cloth of OVA. Yeah, I was going to ask oh, you sorry, about that. Go ahead. No, that's what I, where I wanted yeah. you to go. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. So face cloth of Oviedo is really interesting because if you look at that face cloth, there's no image on it. And there's a very good reason for that because the resurrection happened while, you know, um, you know, a day and a half to, uh, later, right, after the, Jesus' body is brought to the tomb. So at least a day and a half, two days later or so, you know, at least that amount of time has passed. And anyway, when they brought the tomb to the, um, uh, the body to the tomb, they took the face cloth off. That was common practice. And then, of course, they prepared the body, put it uh, into the actual shroud where it's found. So the, the, the radiation event happens at the resurrection. So that happens long after, uh, well, not long after, uh, at least a day and a half to two days after the cloth has been removed from the face. Nevertheless, there's 120 blood stains um, on that cloth. You know, fragments of blood stains and parts of blood stains, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I should say 120 points of congruence on those blood stains. Now, 120 points of congruence with what? With the face on the cloth of Jesus Christ. Okay. Now, that means, like, on the front of the face, there's uh, 50, uh, 70 points of congruence. And on the back, there's 50 points of congruence on those irregular uh, blood stains caused very probably by um, uh, a Syrian Christ thorn, right? The curvature, that large curved 
uh, uh, Christ Dorn that you find uh, in the Middle East there, the Syrian Christ. It's now called the Syrian Christ. Uh, anyway, the, the key to that, though, is all these irregular blood stains are there. How do you get 120 points of congruence, 70 on the front and 50 on the back, going all the way down to the nape of the neck, across the top of the head, all the way around the face? I mean, are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. If those two cloths did not touch the same crucified face uh, uh, almost uh, immediately, um, you know, it was certainly within a day mm -hmm. after Jesus' crucifixion, where the blood was still ha had some moisture that would be able to stick to the cloth, uh, to both cloths. Uh, there's just no possible way of getting that uh, that congruence. Those two cloths touch the same things. So that's the first thing that's very interesting, and that's why I have to believe that the face called the Oviedo is also a, um, a, a you know, definitely an authentic uh, historical artifact of Jesus' uh, crucifixion. It's the one that, you know, in John's Gospel, where, you know, Peter and John come to the tomb, they look inside, and they see, oh, you know, this faith cl face cloth rolled over in a place by itself, uh, says John, and of course that would be the face cloth of Oviedo. But there's a second remarkable similarity between the two cloths. Remember um, a couple of, I think it was a couple of weeks ago anyway, mm -hmm. um, when I was talking about the pollen grains on uh, the Shroud of Turin. And remember I said, you know, the, the 700 year dating could not possibly be correct uh, on the Shroud of Turin. It, it, you know, that 700 year carbon dating uh, is way off because if the Shroud were only in um, uh, Tur uh, uh, if the Shroud were only 700 years old, it could have only been in Lyric, France, and Turin. We have an absolute provenance for the Shroud at 700 years in, in between uh, Lyric, France, and Turin, Italy. So mm -hmm. you'd only have pollen grains from those areas. But that is not the case. Right. The case is the vast majority of pollen grains, three quarters of them, are from where? Jerusalem and northern Judea. That's really interesting. And not only um, do you have the vast majority of, of pollen grains from that area, uh, four of them are completely unique, and 13 of them are indigenous to that region. Are you kidding me? The medieval forger was very assiduous and ingenious indeed, found all of these unique pollen grains, and then planted them on, on the shroud, you know, before it, uh, it, it was uh, taken off to term in Italy where it was monitored. I don't think so. So if that's the case, how is it that three-quarters of the pollen grains come from that region? It had to spend a very long time in that region of northern Judea and Jerusalem. And not only that, part of that time in the open air. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, uh, you can trace right the, the uh, journey of the shroud. You can see then the next proliferation of pollen grains on the shroud comes from Edessa, Turkey. And then the third, uh, the most, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, 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 numerous, um, uh, comes from uh, Constantinople, Turkey. So you keep going and then find the least number come from Lyric, France, and Turin, Italy. So I, I, I leave so it almost with kind of gives you a, almost, almost like a roadmap of how it came to Turin, in the sense of its stop offs yes. on the way, right? That's correct, and where it stayed in that region, right. uh, sometimes in the open air, or sometimes on display for quite some time. And then you can also see the same thing in the face cloth of Oviedo. The biggest proliferation, of course, is there uh, from the Jerusalem area and the northern Judea area because that's where it was in the open air. Right. So, the, of course, the pollen grains are floating around out there. Then the, the second thing that um, to notice is that it goes to Edessa, Turkey. But then the shroud, I mean, the face cloth of Oviedo takes its own tour, stopping off a little way, a little time in Greece, and then it goes to Oviedo, Spain. Right. And we have an absolute provenance of that cloth from 616 onward. Right. So we know the shroud has to be, because just the congruence, um, points of congruence in the bloodstains in the shroud and the face cloth of Oviedo right. indicate it hadn't touched the same face. So if the face cloth of Oviedo goes back to 616, the shroud must go back to 616 as well. But what's interesting is you can see the deviation. The face cloth then goes off uh, to Greece. Probably they're trying to avoid maybe um, uh, some kind of Islamic thing between 616 and 700. It then goes uh, finally into the hands of uh, Isidore of Seville and then it's placed in that cathedral of in Oviedo, Spain, and it's not removed again. 
Um, you know, so it there's where it stays. Its provenance is very secure there. And you compare it today. I mean, it, there's just I, I have to believe that face cloth is definitely the face cloth that was used to transport Jesus from the cross over to the tomb. And that just brings me to one other thing. I don't know about Montpellier, but you know that um, that image that was p uh, painted by Eugene uh, Kazanowski, um, you know the uh, uh, Polish um, painter um, who uh, did uh, the second kind of painting. Uh, but uh, this is the one that was very accurate indeed of um, uh, Saint Faustina Kowalska. You know she had the you know, divine mercy. You know seeing Jesus Christ, divine mercy, and, and you know Jesus asked her to to have a painter do the Divine Mercy image. Well, um, she, well, she, she actually kind of, I think, maybe drove Eugene Kazanowski <laughs> to the brink, but she had 10 different painting sessions with corrections upon corrections upon corrections. Well, if you look up, you know, maybe just uh, the uh, viewers can t take a look on their right. Google and just see the comparison. Um, there's two kinds of things that are done uh, to compare the uh, face that um, uh, Faustina Kowalska, um, you know, dictated to Eugene Kazanowski and the shroud face. Now, right. you look at that, the, uh, the, the pupil right. distance, uh, well, you have to enlarge the, 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 the slightly... Um, the head of Jesus on the Kazanowski painting because it was painted in a little smaller proportion. But the main thing is once you enlarge it and you line up the, the, um, the hairlines of both right. um, uh, uh, images, you can see the pupil distance is identical in the sh uh, shroud and in uh, the Kazanowski. You can also see the size of the nose and the shape of the nose is the same. You right. can also see that the size of the beard and the mustache and the cut of the beard and mustache are the same. You can see that the length of the hair and the hairstyle, the lie of the hair on the side is the same. I'm not kidding you. And the, right. and the shape of no, the absolutely. lips, etc., are the same. And, yeah, and, I mean, it's we, just like, holy Like you mackerel. said, you can see it, and she our friends, obviously, in Stockbridge have have uh, indicated that and promoted that fact too. In the closing 10 minutes, I just wanted oh, okay. to hit on the, uh, sure. uh, get to the Eucharistic uh, topic there on the sure. five Eucharistic graces towards spiritual and moral conversion. You said, these transformative graces are sometimes incisive and powerful, sometimes subtle and gradual. In my case, they have mostly yeah. been the latter, but over the course of time, they have become radically transformative. Why do you think do you think for most people, in your case it was that way, is most people, do they have the, that, you know, that incisive and powerful, or is most of the time subtle? And if so, why do you think it is that way? 